And it's also nice so that, uh, <clears throat> you know, with Zoom, we can actually have the visual images of our community. So feel free to scroll around and in these early minutes, if you get on a few minutes before, and we usually wait one or two minutes, just feel free to say hi to the whole community or individuals that are friends just like you would walking in to common ground, the actual physical space, which I can attest to still exists. I'm here, <laughs> but it's a little strange that you're not here. So just appreciating who's here with us and really sensing that community and even more than the people who are at the Zoom meeting, the people who will listen later and all the other folks before us and who will come after us who are really drawn to these practices and these teachings and really benefiting and keeping these forces of wisdom and compassion alive in our hearts and in our world. And as I mentioned, we're gonna do this five subjects for frequent recollection. Now you'll see it there in the chat if you're not familiar with the words. There's a word near the end, kama, which is the same as the Buddhist word karma, which means actions done with intention. And the point there is actions done with intention leave an impression in our hearts. There's impact and we want to wake up to that impact. So let's do this chant and then we'll sit for about 30 minutes. Five subjects for frequent recollection. I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. I am the owner of my karma heir to my karma, born of my karma, related to my karma, abide supported by my karma. Whatever karma I shall do, for good or for ill, of that, I will be the heir. Thus we should frequently recollect. And settle in for the sitting time. We've muted everybody and please, it's nice to help your, have your help to keep um, the computer muted. And if you do need to move around, part of the etiquette is just shut your video off while you're moving around during the meditation time, especially. And that just keeps our visual field a little bit more settled. And of course, it's nice to have your video on once you're settled there in front of the camera, but it's also depending on your circumstances, it's always okay to be here without your video, if that feels better for you. So as we settle and meet the experience of the body sitting here, the body that is relatively relaxed and relatively still,
relatively upright in a way that supports alertness. Opening to the body is really our gateway to opening up to life, to nature, to the way that it is. In Buddhism, we use the word sometimes dharma or dhamma. So coming into the body is more than just remembering that there's a body. It reminds us that we're in this swirl, this movement of life, and that we're not in control and that this mute movement of life, like the movement of sensation in our body right now, or the movement in our wide, wider world, all the social political changes that are swirling, all the unknowns and ambiguity. But we find that right here, this opening to the body in a way is a microcosm of opening to our whole world. All the joys and sorrows and our friends and family and the wider world and our own movement of joys and sorrows that we experience and maybe even are experiencing right now. And of course, as we open to the body and as we open to life as it is, those deep habits of being in denial or being distracted or thinking we've got to control or fix stuff, all those habit energies are going to get triggered. So as an alternative to falling into those habits of denial or controlling, we have this alternative to be opening in a full, kind, tender-hearted way. So we bring, we recall, and we trust this actual capacity of my heart right here and now to bring this embracing, kind and <clears throat> tender-hearted connection, first and foremost to the breathing body here, feeling the sits bones on the chair, on the cushion, wherever we're sitting. Feeling the obvious structure the skeleton in the body, the musculature, feeling the warmth or coolness here in the body. There's really no way to be intimate with life, to have a real connection with life if we're not learning how to be open, how to be embodied here and now. And I'm sure you're learning it's not about demanding or expecting a perfect bodily experience now, that the breath will be perfect, that the sensations will be pleasant and pleasant in a perfect kind of way. Now the point is actually that it's not perfect, that it's not fixed. It's not dependable or what's dependable is that it's changing, that it's wild, that it's alive with change, this body and this world. And just maybe there's a kind of love, a compassion, a tenderheartedness that is sufficient to embrace, to relax, and to really trust this wild, hot mess of the body, of our sensitive hearts, of our thinking minds, 
of the wider world, what's moving, what's coming and going. So in the safety, the relative safety of our set, the relative comfort of sitting here now with our community, we can experiment putting down the armor, including any defensiveness that expresses itself as my mind clinging to an idea, clinging to any sense of certainty and letting that be replaced with a more open, who knows, who knows. And we're learning to trust that life, the movement of sensation in this body, the movement of emotion in the heart, the movement of mental activity, just appreciating the aliveness and appreciating not having to be in control, not having to have any expectation or agenda. What a relief it is for a moment or a few moments, what a relief it is to simply allow life to keep moving, to feel the boundless energy here in the heart, body, and mind. And not to feel like I have to even have a fixed idea of what it all means. Putting all that down. And in a way we're learning to abide in the vast movement. Sometimes that movement is quite settled. And sometimes the movement of life, the life of the body and mind is quite alive with change and even intense. But maybe that's okay. Sometimes settled, sometimes intense. Maybe that's how it is. Maybe, just maybe, it all belongs. So we meet our life, our world with kindness and tender heartedness, like a warmth, a generous warmth that spreads from the heart, fills the space of the body fills the space of the heart and mind, fills the whole world. This very simple, beautiful, generous quality of love that allows us to be right in the middle and to some degree free from fear. So we're exploring that capacity to abide in metta and karuna, this basic goodness and tender heartedness, this generous warmth, expansive warmth, this affectionate presence. as if there were a beautiful, sublime smile. The heart itself had a beautiful, sublime, generous smile. A healing smile. Willing to touch everything, to hold everything. This is the great fullness of metta and karuna, 
loving kindness and compassion. In a way, it's an active expression of wisdom, the wisdom of non-fear. So we're expressing a non-fear in meeting, being intimate with our lives. So we'll continue for a while in silence. Keep returning to this, trusting that this heart has the capacity to love generously right now. This radiance that is, that spreads and fills the space of the body, the heart and mind, and outward in all directions simple but beautiful, this beautiful wish for ease. May all beings, this being, all beings, find ways to live their lives with ease, with wisdom and love, with great skill. This is the generosity of love, compassion, And we're learning to abide in the, that wholesome way of relating and letting it have its healing effect on the body and the mind.
keeping it really simple. It's not so much that we're trying to generate love. The feeling is more like being a conduit. The heart is open and this energy, this generous energy of connection, this inclusivity where everything belongs, this moment belongs. We're letting this move through the conduit, the openness of our heart. Initially, it might feel like it has a lot of warmth, but then just let it keep opening. It might have a more cool, expansive quality of equanimity and balance from kindness to compassion, appreciation, and to this vast, beautiful balance, this balance that comes from wisdom that understands the way it is. Oh yeah, this is how it is right now. This is what's moving here in the body and the mind, what's moving in the world. Can this be okay? Yeah. Yeah, this can be okay. The heart knows how to hold it all. So in a way we're learning how to experience the heart as vast as the whole world, the whole universe. The mind, the heart, even the sense of the body. Let it become quite vast, open like space itself and see if you can rest in that vastness, that peace, that silence, not forever, but just as a training. Is it okay to put everything down and just to abide in the space, the vast space of the present moment, the peaceful, quiet space of the present moment. Of course, the activity is still there, but we're attuning to the vastness of the space, the silence itself. This is what the heart is interested in, the great space of the present moment.
and to whatever degree it's possible. See if you can be interested in the experience of peace, even if it has a cool, expansive quality to it, subtle quality. Be interested in peace and practice resting, trusting. And whenever the mind is drawn into self-centered dramas, then the peace begins to dissipate. And whenever the mind keeps in mind the vastness of the peace, stillness, the letting go, the non-attachment, And it doesn't matter what's happening in the background, little thoughts, other experiences. Right now, keeping in mind the vast peace here, like a great background of peace that we now have brought into the foreground. Peace and ease is available. Can we keep it in mind for a while? And we're aligning our mind, our heart, our body. We're aligning our whole life with this experience of ease and balance and peace. What would it be to return to the busyness of our lives, complexion, complexities of our lives with this background of balance and ease and peace, even while we're navigating the ups and downs and the challenges. So if you haven't already, let the eyes open if they've been closed and feel free to adjust your bodies. And again, just if you would be willing to help us keep yourself muted. And the reason for that is uh, we are recording these Zoom meetings. And if you're not muted, then the your camera might be highlighted. And then Rachel, who's volunteered to help Gabe 
edit these so that they can be put up on the live stream. Then they have to edit out all those times that your camera got highlighted in the, the Zoom stream. So it really makes the editor's job a lot easier if, except during the discussion times, you keep your, um, your audio on mute. And if you have any uh, questions about that, you can just put something in the chat and Jessica, one of our longtime volunteers, Years. can uh, let you know how to um, mute yourself if you're not sure how to do that. And um, one of the reasons we've moved from live stream to Zoom is it makes the after program discussion group so much easier. So those of you who'd like to stay around, um, as you probably have heard in previous weeks, Shannon and Nancy, two longtime teachers at the center, have uh, volunteered to alternate. So I think this week Shannon will be here and you can just stay right in the Zoom room and we'll give time for people who aren't going to be part of the small group discussions to uh, exit. And then Shannon will introduce how that all works. But basically, Shannon will be dividing you into small groups. So you can connect with some people in the community and chat about some of the themes from your practice and from the talk today. And that usually lasts 15 to 20 minutes. Good, so I'll get started. Um, kind of nice to be able to see folks. <laughs> so I'm glad you found your way over to the uh, Zoom room. And we're finishing up, I'm finishing up a series of talks on the Buddhist teachings on impermanence, one of the most central themes the Buddha kept returning to. And the basic idea uh, in terms of how the Buddha came to understand our human predicament, which is trying to be happy, but doing stuff in our attempt to be happy that causes us to be unhappy. And in a way we can say that broke the, the Buddha's heart wide open. After he had sort of found his own way, understood what his heart was misunderstanding. And then it really got clear, oh yeah, everybody wants to be happy. And this is an especially useful time, you know, depending on where you find yourself on the political divide, you know, it's really nice for us to remember that all of us, those who have similar ideas or similar life experiences, those who have different ideas and different life experiences, we just want to be happy. But often what we're doing, how we're relating to our life sets in motion suffering for ourselves and suffering for others, those around us in the wider world. And on and on it goes. And the Buddha in his provocative way said, you can't even conceive of the beginning of how we've been doing this, basically in trying to be happy, setting in motion unhappiness. So it's got some real momentum. It's a deep group. And like in more specific terms, our approach to being happy is to identify with desire, which becomes craving. Like we believe, we trust, we take craving personally. If only, then I'll be happy. If only I become somebody, if only I become a perfect Buddhist meditator, then I'll be happy. If only I get rid of my bad habits, then I'll be happy. And in your small, like if you stay for the small group, it would be fun actually to hear everyone sort of name a few of your if onlys, because we all have, if only I had a cup of green tea, then, you know, just that little buzz from green tea, then I'd be happy for what, 10 minutes, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It's sort of like, this is why we go that way. Cause there actually is gratification when we get what we want but it doesn't resolve the problem. It actually masks the problem. So we avoid the problem, which is sense experience doesn't lead to lasting peace. Doesn't mean sense experience isn't important, right? It is important. If we're starving, if we're being oppressed, if life isn't fair, that's a real disturbance. 
But just because life becomes more fair doesn't mean we're all of a sudden not going to have problems as a human being. Being privileged doesn't mean we're not suffering. It's still, I don't know about you, but most of us would choose to have affluence, choose to have our health, choose to be living in a place where people know how to get along, treat each other with respect, right? We'd all choose that. But, you know, being here in Minneapolis, it's not a bad place. And still, right, I notice for myself, I notice as much as I can sense the people around me, you know, we're not perfectly happy. So what I thought would be useful to talk about today is the, in Buddhism, the word Nibbana, you know, or Nirvana is used for awakening, full awakening. And that's interesting word. First of all, it was an ordinary word at the time of the Buddha. It wasn't like a spiritual word. It was the ordinary word like the fire has gone out and now it's cool. So that word for the fire going out and now it's cool was Nibbana or a related word to Nibbana. So it really means that the fire has gone out and has cooled down. And now that's an interesting word for the Buddha, for uh, someone who is trying to share an understanding that it has arisen in their own life that has brought full freedom, let's say. Let's just presume the Buddha's uh, the Buddha was accurate in terms of reporting his own experience. And so that the fact that he chose that word, Nibbana, Nirvana, to like, oh yes, something, the fire of craving, the fire, the agitation, the burning agitation of if only, then I'll be happy, that's gone out. Now, the interesting thing is, as you hear that, and we try to imagine my if only, then I'll be happy going out. Then the only thing uh, often, the only thing we can imagine is like, I'll just stagnate on a couch somewhere. You know, if I don't have my if only, if only I, I've been noticing, I don't know if it's my male midlife, although I'm, I don't think I can claim midlife anymore being in my 60s, but <laughs> you know, I've noticed I'm attracted and I have my excuses, but I've been attracted to getting a pickup. <laughs> it's that conditioning, you know, like the little boy with my taco trucks. I don't know, people from, it was that just Minnesota that had taco toys, taco trucks, but the other big steel trucks, you know, that boys mostly got when we were kids, and pushed around in sandboxes, you know. But anyway, we get this imprint and we want something that's strong and dependable. And it's just one of those, if only, you know, if only I had a dependable car, if only I, and, and we sort of lean in, we, we get spellbound by our if onlys. So now the Buddha is asking us, so by using a word like Nibbana, the coolness, the coolness of peace, the coolness of contentedness, how that could be something that's quite beautiful and enlivening because it, it's a real, initially it's a real stretch for us because when we hear something like coolness, the fire of craving going out, we think of a loser, you know, somebody who doesn't have their act together, has given up and counting the days until life ends, right? So we, we have to revision our aspiration. And I think this is why um, just, you know, in terms of teachings, it's really nice to uh, sense the inclusive and generous exposure of love, compassion, how to integrate that with this coolness of wisdom that's often in Buddhist terms described as a deepening disenchantment, dispassion, Right? We're disenchanted, not with the world so much, but with attachment to the world or dependence on our if only, then I'll be happy. Right? So there's a real movement, you know, as insight deepens, 
then the mind wisdom matures like, oh, you know what? There is no experience that's going to make this sense of me perfectly happy forever. That's not the point. That's not the role of sense experience to make somebody happy. Sense experience is just this tremendous wild movement of causes and conditions. It doesn't have that personal purpose to make, I mean, it's sort of arrogant to think of that, right? Like somehow the world of you know nature causes and conditions is specifically here to provide you or me or all of us happiness, right? It's a real self-centered view of what we call the universe, that somehow that's its point to make me happy. And I don't know about your happiness, but my happiness is pretty fickle. You know, I think something's going to make me happy and I get bored with it pretty quickly. Even like relatively meaningful things, like having a nice home. And now I have a, I feel like a really nice home, but you know, I'm not getting a lot of juice from it. <laughs> Even though, you know, objectively speaking, it's really nice place. It's comfortable. I have what I need. But then, it, you know, maybe in the first, you know, every time we do something and makes it a little bit nicer, then it, it sort of, I get a little juice from the niceness of my, the place where I live, but it's short lived. I'm sure that would be true. Even if I got the perfect pickup that's all powerful and doesn't damage the environment, you know, runs on carbon <laughs> and just eliminates it from the atmosphere, right? The perfect pickup or whatever, you know, it would be great for a while. And then it, it would no longer feed the ego, it would no longer be a source of satisfaction. And then I'd want this amazing camper in the back of the pickup where I could go anywhere and have all the comforts of life, comfortable bed, you know, great kitchen, <laughs> all kinds of things and on and on and on. And it's that's the burning of craving, the sort of endlessness of samsara, as we call it in Buddhism, where the wanting for something perfect, that burning, that hunger never ends, on and on and on. So the Buddha, after in understanding what happened to him with his own deepening of understanding, then he had to do the second task. He'd already done the task of liberating his heart from that loop of wanting, craving, if only, right? But then he had this other job now because of compassion. How can I articulate what happened to me, which wasn't about you know, words, right? But now how can I articulate it in words so that other people can realize the same thing. So in, you know, in the way it is in early Buddhism, the insight, the liberation that the Buddha realized is available to anybody who sees and understands what the Buddha or any awakened person has seen and understood. There's not like one person's awakening is greater than another person's awakening. Anybody who fully awakens experiences the release of their heart no longer confused by those habits of if only. And this is sometimes described as a kind of coolness. So this last number, couple months, when I've been sharing some of the Buddhist teachings on impermanence, you know, the basic path the Buddha came up with is you're not going to be good for anyone unless you stabilize present moment awareness. You have to stabilize, you have to develop this particular mental muscle to be present with some continuity. If you don't do that, you're destined to be on autopilot where you're, the habits that have the most strength or momentum are going to sweep your mind or heart away over and over again. And the only way to break the mind's dependence on its habit energies is to replace the following of our habits, the predominant habits, with this capacity to be present. Because being aware of the habit energies is different than being caught in them. So that's the first step. It's like, 
you're just going to endlessly spin in the cycles of suffering, samsara, unless first and foremost, you value present moment awareness and to develop that skill to be present so that you can be present with some continuity, not just when you're sitting in a formal meditation time, but eventually in your days. Not, not that I or anybody I know can do this continuously, but the more we practice sincerely, the more there are just naturally moments of mindfulness through the day. I'm sure most of you can attest to that, right? Where you just realize, oh, it's like this now. This is being known. And then that might be sustained for some amount of time before the mind takes the bait, gets caught, spins with some drama, planning mind, worrying mind, judging mind, comparing mind, whatever. We're in that self-centered vortex for a while, not mindful, not present. But often those self-centered vortexes start to hurt and the pain wakes us up. Oh, what's going on? Oh, I've been lost in thought. I've been obsessing about this or worrying about that or wanting revenge or caught in that if only then I'll be happy fantasy, right? But now we have space in a sense around it. Oh yeah, that was just that self-centered drama. Feels like this in the body. This is the reverberation of being caught up. It feels like this. Can it be okay? Can I actually feel what I'm feeling? Be here now, open, generously open, not afraid to feel the reverberation of what the mind has previously been entangled with. Because there's always something that lives on if we've been caught up in drama for a while. And it's not just the immediate, immediately previous drama, but all the years and decades, and even the cultural dramas that we're caught in, like the divisiveness of our politics these days, where we feel so justified to demean the other side. I mean, it's really amazing how um, we feel justified to hate, to throw out of our hearts, when if we were having a spiritual conversation, we would never openly say, yeah, it's totally okay to hate somebody, to demean them, to think they're not worthy of compassion. And yet, you know, in terms of politics, it's sort of a blood sport and we, somehow it's okay. And I've mentioned this a lot, just in, you know, the humor, the professional comedians and just, uh, I find it funny, but I, I'm a little sickened by the meanness and the lack of compassion. Because even if someone is really doing harmful things, you know, is that someone we should have compassion for? Or is that somebody we should belittle? Because I don't know about you, but you know, when you imagine somebody that you think is really a force for no good, a force for evil in the world, would you wanna be that person? What is the appropriate way to relate? Does it mean that we let people walk all over us, oppress us, dominate us? That's not good for them. And it's certainly not good for us. It's really appropriate to do whatever we can, even at times to raise our voice and uh, you know, get in the streets or whatever it might be. But that hatred or that demeaning kind of energy, it's basically, it's just another version of if only, another one of those, uh, the burning of craving, the burning of attachment, of grasping. So, so much of what the Buddha tried to set in motion is like stabilize present moment awareness. And then with that stable, ongoing present moment awareness, however stable, however continuous it is, then just have a more and more honest relationship. And what do we see? Well, we see everything's changing. I mean, we really saw that this week. So many, you know, because just like, I'm not even talking about the politics or the end of the election, it just our own attitudes, like maybe deep despair, maybe extreme joy, and maybe everything in between, and maybe a lot of up and downs with all of that, right? We felt a lot of different things probably. And so, but it's interesting how in every moment when we felt despair or we felt joy, in that moment, 
the idea was that's who I am in some sort of lasting or real sense. But now with some more perspective, we see, no, it didn't really last that long. And it's actually really helpful, you know, in terms of any hope that we might be feeling now. It's not like hope is bad, but we don't want to imagine hope is anything more than what it is. It's a hopeful feeling being felt. It isn't the truth. And just like if, you know, um, if, you know, your political orientation is different and you're feeling a lot of anger or despair, what is that? Well, that's anger and despair being known here and now. And we know it keeps changing. We don't want to build a sense of me around our hope or around our fear. Some of you have heard me because I quote this a lot from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And it's, uh, it's a, a sign to Milarepa, this one of the patron saints of Buddhism in, in Tibetan Buddhism, a character who lived back in the 1300s or thereabouts. And uh, one of the uh, messages he got from his own practice was on the steep slope of fear and hope the demons lie awaiting. But when we get drawn into fear and hope. So this is an especially good time for a lot of us to uh, directly experiment with the coolness of non-attachment. Instead of getting seduced by any joy or seduced by any fear and locking in, it's like, who knows? Who knows? And we're really cultivating a taste, like how that who knows, how that openness and equanimity can be quite alive. And this is really, uh, it needs to be a realization. We have to actually discover that balance and evenness and the coolness of peace is actually a very functional, skillful, healing, beautiful way to live a life, a human life. We just don't have a lot of role models. That's the problem, right? We have a lot of role models who live their lives in a hot way, really, you know, acting out. And we're, we're inspired by that because, you know, at least they seem alive. You know, they seem engaged. They're not holding back. Because there is something like we trust about uh, disconnecting, we know isn't the way. Turning away from life, turning away from what we're feeling, turning away from what's happening around us. We know that that can't be a long-term strategy. It may be reasonable for a moment to close the door, to turn away, to put things down, like we do when we sit in the morning. You know, those of you who have a regular sitting practice, part of the sitting practice is learning to put everything down, just not paying attention to our worries, not paying attention to our hopes, right? So when we use a meditation object like the breath or even a more expansive feeling of love like we did today and earlier in the sit, that's one way to put everything else down. But the other half of meditation and more generally the path is to learn how to include everything, to pick everything up. But we wanna keep the silence and the stillness and the balance and the coolness and the peace, even while we re-engage and have a heated discussion or make a difficult choice or you know, relax into the hot mess of our families, of our jobs, of our world because it is, it's wild, it's hot, it's uncertain, it's ambiguous. It seems like that's just the territory of human life. Generally speaking, there are periods where things are a little, have the appearance of being more orderly and settled, but that's, you know, those are usually arise because we're not seeing the whole picture. You know, we'll be in a peaceful meadow watching the butterflies flit about but it doesn't occur to us that, you know, 
the temperatures are a lot hotter than they should be in November in Minnesota. <laughs> We've had an amazing, for those who aren't living here, an amazingly warm week after getting eight inches of snow, maybe two or three weeks ago, and a bunch of cold weather. And it's been in the 70s now for most of the last week, which is really unusual for this time of year. So when we take in the big picture, we realize that even when things appear really nice on the surface, there's so much uncertainty behind everything. So many forces at play that we know one thing, this heart can't count on anything except one thing. And that's really this direction of coolness. Now we could call it letting go, you know, counting on letting go counting on non-attachment. We don't want to make it a thing because then it becomes part of that if only. If only I learn how to let go, then I'll be happy. And whenever we're attached to an if only, then we've created an enemy. If only I let go, if only I realize Nibbana, the heart that lets go, the heart that's free of all grasping, then I'll be saved. And so then what, what happens to my mind? Now I'm afraid of attachment. I'm afraid of grasping. I'm afraid of anything that I want to hold on to. And then that just becomes the next way of grasping. You know, I'm identified with being someone who lets go. I'm afraid of being somebody who has attachments. So that's a too superficial um, understanding of what the Buddha is pointing to. Because even where there is liking, you know, like you're outside today, evidently it's going to get cold again here in Minnesota. So you're enjoying the sun and the relative warmth today in Minnesota. And is there a way to have that generous, that warm, open hearted connection with the pleasure of being in the warmth and in the sunshine? but not losing the coolness, that vast understanding, and it won't always be this way. And that's really that integration of love and wisdom. If love is this quality, this generous quality of the heart that can say yes, and can grow roots of compassion when they're suffering, of appreciation when it's beautiful. And the coolness of wisdom is knowing that as beautiful or horrific as this moment is, there's a balance, there's an evenness, there's a peace that remains unstained. And I know it sounds paradoxical, like how can I be open to the feeling of being connected and caring and appreciating what's beautiful and being moved by the real suffering. How can I be in this exposed place and at the same time, a heart that's peaceful and even and balanced and in a way, unshakable. And that's why it's a realization. So we use these two ideas of that love being that total exposure and connection and heartfelt feeling. So it's not that we're not feeling. All, so that's like the human end of it. Love in a way, as in the way I use the word at least, is the, um, is the word we use to point to what it feels like and looks like for a human being to be free, right? It's this generous, heartfelt connection because who or what would be afraid of being connected? If there's still somebody who's afraid of, a, of the exposure of life, that's, that's not freedom. So it's in a way, it's the active expression of the freedom the, that comes from the wisdom that knows how to let go. So this is a place we can experiment, you know, in those moments, those of you who have kids where the interaction with your child is relatively settled and not so intense, then just 
practice realizing directly in your own mind, your own heart, that, that real warmth of connection, that embracing the whole hot mess of my son, my daughter, my child, right? And, and the not knowing how it's gonna play out, right? And without losing that unshakable balance, that depth of peace, even though you know you can't control, you can't even protect your kid 100%. Same thing with those of you in you know, romantic or intimate relationships or with people, dear friends, or passions you have in life about making the world a better place for the people who are more actively activists in terms of transforming the world. How can we really care and have that unshakable peace and balance. Do we need grasping to be 100% engaged? How might that peace, what is the, how might peace get in the way of engagement? Why do we sometimes think that non-attachment has to be synonymous, synonymous with disengagement and engagement needs to be synonymous with attachment. And this is really what the, the Buddhist teachings are pointing us to. This is a line that Venerable Analio uses. I forget if I read this last week. The void of emptiness is full to the brim of causes and conditions. So the void of emptiness is really the phrase sometimes we use in Buddhism, that vast space is really what makes the heart unshakable, balanced, peaceful, even. So that understanding, like, you know, just, it's just a metaphor, but if we're living this ordinary life on a particular corner where our house or apartment is, with these particular relationships, with this particular body, but the view is the view of the whole universe. And if we're in a multi-universe universe, then the view of all those universes, right? So we have the vast view, but that vastness is showing up in this very particular location, a white man in a 62 year old body with these relationships, with this sexual orientation, with these responsibilities, with this kind of cultural conditioning, this baggage, right? But with that vast view of everything being included. That's a, a metaphor we can use. Because you know, like when we get really, um, the view is really specific to like this particular power dynamic I'm in the middle of with this other person and how come they're not treating me this way? And that's the sum total of my view. Then everything that person says or does, how they express their own cultural conditioning and whatever, it's so impactful. It's devastating. I get completely pushed around, just like maybe we did with politics these last months, riding the roller coaster up and down around climate change, around all these impactful things. You know, the next incident of racial injustice that's gotten captured on video, you know, and then we're sort of face to face with the enormity of this sort of residue of hatred, racial hatred, and how it's just built in still in our culture. And then we just maybe feel crushed or maybe feel motivated or whatever our response is, you know, and our hearts are constantly pushed around. So how do we not lose that, that aspect of love that allows us to connect and to feel, how to maintain that with the, uh, the great vast space? I've always uh, found it trustworthy how in a lot of spiritual teachings, there are these you know, emphasis on having insight into the reality of non-grasping, 
into that vastness. Like even in the guided sit today, you might have noticed, you know, starting with this more intimate warmth, connecting with the body in our life, and just this movement towards the vastness of balance and letting go. But the, it's always important to understand that then spiritual life is always about whatever insight, whatever deepening trust we have about the um, healing beauty of peace, the peace of non-grasping, the peace of non-attachment, then the next part of our practice, well, what is that space of peace, that space of balance look like when I have to be a parent? when I have to be a lover, when I have to be a concerned citizen? How does that peace then inform my re-entry into the hot mess of our lives? That's part of the practice. I think I mentioned last week or maybe two weeks ago, this quote from Chanul, this uh, very well-known person who brought, who was part of bringing Buddhism, the Buddhist teachings into Korea. Again, this is back maybe in the 1300s as well. And uh, so from China into Korea, about the same time, some of the teachings on Zen, Chan Buddhism, which is what it's called in China, was being brought into Japan by Dogen. Um, this other person was bringing some of these teachings into Korea approximately the same time. And he had this statement, this teaching phrase, sudden awakening, gradual cultivation. So, First of all, we're not good for anybody. So we stabilize present moment awareness. When we do that, when we're able to be present, then we open to the immediacy of our own experience of our body and mind. And it teaches the heart to let go. Because as we see things are changing and not worthy of grasping and not personal, then the heart naturally develops disenchantment and dispassion into letting go letting go of selfing, letting go of grasping because of selfing, right? And the heart experiences moments of that free fall of non-grasping. We want to have a lot of humility about that actual experience of non, those experiences of non-grasping. Like maybe I don't know what that experience is because intellectually we know, we know that experience or what those words mean, you know, to, not grasp anything, not to be identified or attached to anything. But when we experience that, it's, it's sort of a real shift, like a seismic shift in our understanding. It changes us. And then the peace, like as we move in that direction where there's less and less grasping, less and less attachment, we really get a sense, the flavor of that peace that vast space of non-grasping. And then we want to, like it, that experience makes an impression in our heart, our mind stream. So then when we come back into our relationships and the messiness of our lives, it's like keeping that impression of the peace in mind as we fall in love, as we get involved, as we earn our living, as we take care of our aging body, as we do our living. That's really the scope of our practice. So I'll come back to this next week, or one, at least one more week on this subject as we wrap up these teachings. Really nice to be with everyone. We have a couple of special events coming up besides all the usual practice discussions and Shelley Graff's Wednesday night practice group. And we're, um, we've been developing this Tuesday evening program that Dharma Among Us, Shelley and now Patrice will be joining Shelley as the MC. And it's a time this Tuesday night program to bring in different voices, some of the newer teachers at Common Ground, but all, even uh, voices from outside of the Common Ground community. And this Tuesday, we have a, a special guest teacher, Jason Soule, the past president of the Minneapolis AA, uh, NAACP and a professor at Hamlin University in criminal justice and a, a real activist. And so the program is called Action Speak Louder Than Words. How do you bring your values to the work of racial justice? So that's this Tuesday on Zoom, seven to nine. We are asking people to sign up just so we have a sense 
of how many people are going to come, but everyone's invited, even if you sign up at the last moment. And then a week from yesterday, this coming Saturday, Shelly, Scotty, Cecilia, Stacy, and myself will be leading uh, Living the Practice Workshop. We usually do these once a quarter. This one is on Othering and Belonging. And we'll just be unpacking how we other people and how we use the sense of belonging and how that can cause suffering, but also can be yeah, just, it's inevitable, just the way we get, uh, use identities and it can be quite useful to use identities, but we don't wanna get confused where we're actually throwing people out of our heart and dependent on belonging. So join us for that. That's 9.30 to 4 next Saturday. And as I said, there's lots of other programs coming up. So let me make sure that Shannon is here. Shannon, I'm assuming you're here to break people up. For those who are going to leave, wishing you a good week. So nice to be with you this morning. But if you'd like to be part of the small groups, just hang around.